Genesis chapter 18, would you stand one more time together with me as we look into the Word of God for the last few moments we have today. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet him and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the trees. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. For time, let's jump down to the end of the passage. And um, verse number 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, surely I shall bear a child since I am old? Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Father, I pray in the moments we have together that we would, Lord, get a renewed understanding of the power of Almighty God. The Lord, not just knowing this from a distance and understanding what it means for me today, what it means for the battles that I face, for the fears that I have, Lord, for the questions that I have, that your word would come alive today through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray if there's anyone here watching that could not honestly say they know for sure they're on their way to heaven, that even today would be the day that they, Lord, would learn about you. We love you, Lord. I pray you put your hand of blessing upon these few moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. One of the things that's intriguing, if you ever have somebody try to sell something to you, I think it was Warren and just say this, he came to me, he goes, it's nice to see your hands in your pockets for a change, right? That's what happens to salesmen. They've got their hands in other people's pockets, and we joke, that's what preachers are. Preachers are usually accused of that. Always talking about money, right? Always looking to get something. But you ever have it? Um, somebody call you up, that we actually in the process of putting solar on our house, and so last Monday we signed the contract, problem solved, right? I get a text. We're installing it Monday. And I'm like, that is the quickest I've ever seen. This is amazing. And I'm like, man, we chose the right company. And they gave me, we just signed in. You know, I, I, you know, it's always a different name of the person actually installing it than who's servicing it. And then later in the day, later in the week, yesterday, I get a text from the company we signed. We're in design phase. We're almost ready to schedule your install. I'm like, what? And what had happened was the company I canceled with, who has ignored me for the last three months, scheduled me for Monday. That's a quick way to keep the business. I'm like, yeah, you can install it. I don't have financing. You can go ahead and put it on my roof. I'm okay with that. And I called them up. They're like, well, we wondered if you were maybe not wanting to use us. And they try to sell it back. And I'm like, when I said, you know, lying's not the best way to get people to stay with you. But you know what's funny? When you talk to a salesperson, what do they say? I promise you, you need this. For years, when I was in college, for one year, I got to work in, in sales. How many of you work in sales? How many of you love working in sales? Okay, some of you do. To me, the one I was insulted because they told me how good of a salesman I was. You know, because I worked at Sears and then I worked at a jewelry store. Why jewelry? They paid more. Anyway, and I got discounts for my wife. But I remember when I got there one month, I had won, you know, salesperson of the month for four months straight. And one week I'd won. They were mad because people, I'd won. I wasn't even there that week. People pulled things off layaway. And I remember, but you know what they taught you in sales? When someone comes in, Okay, you take them, you never take them to the most expensive thing first. You bring them to something cheaper, tell them how dumpy it is and work your way up, right? That's how you do it. Now, the goal would be you've got to tell them why they need this. That's one of the reasons I wasn't good at working in electronics. I'll never forget the first guy bought off me, he paid $1,000 for a surround sound system. And he goes, I got financing, 10 bucks a month. He is still paying off that sound system 30 years later. You know that, right? You know, it's amazing. You know, you got to convince them they need this. And that's the problem. And so sometimes people say, you need this. I, pro I promise you. You ever wonder why people have to use the phrase, I promise? Why? Because they know they're lying to you. And so they have to say it. And so my, many times when you hear someone or someone tells you they're going to do something, you're like, ah, we'll see. But when you think about the promises of God, and I, trust me, and some of you would say, I don't know about this. More than likely, there's one or two, if not many in this room, who have sometime in their Christian journey wondered if God has just fell, failed in fulfilling his promise. And I guarantee you there's going to be a list of reasons in your life why. I remember sitting in a hospital room with my family 
as my sister was passing away into heaven. I remember sitting there asking my dad, pastor, God could have healed her, why didn't he? And you wonder. God never promised to heal, but you look at some of those things and you wonder why. Why didn't he do this? Why is he allowing these things? To, will God fulfill his promise? Can he be trusted? And then if you've ever met a preacher or a Christian who was in leadership who failed, then you begin to wonder, can I trust God because of what they did? What I want to do for the next few moments is just talk about how, one, we can trust God, and two, that God's got something great for us to accomplish, and we, want, we should step out boldly to do what God wants us to do. And it takes faith. It takes courage to do this. And we're going to look at one more time where Abraham and, Abraham and Sarah were given a promise. You know, as we look at the story of these two, we see them following God, leaving home, going to a new place. But one of the reasons they were promised is they were promised they would be a, a father of a great nation, which means they would be given a son, an heir. They've been waiting for a long time, and we've even seen their impatience in this waiting if we look past this time, we can see God's promise revealed in a man by the name of Isaac. I won't take a lot of time to jump into it. Most of us are familiar with Isaac, who ultimately became the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob, who became the father of the 12 sons, now of the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. We see God's promise fulfilled through Isaac. When we look at the nation of Israel today, we see God's promises to Abraham fulfilled and still being fulfilled, and, and a lot of Old Testament promises still to be fulfilled in their future ahead of us. We can now look at the story we're looking, studying today and see God's promises fulfilled, and it makes it easier to believe that God's telling the truth. But then I ask the question, what about my circumstances? What about those things that I'm asking God to do? What about the promises that he's given us in Scripture? What about unanswered prayer? What about the mountain that we're facing or the giant that's in front of us right now that we're asking God to move? I'm going to give you a thought. This is just a thought that goes through my mind. There's not a lot of deep theology behind it. But I think sometimes it's easier to read the Bible and see what's happening than it is to live the events today. I'll give you an example. It's easy to read the book of Job, isn't it? Number one, it's not happening to us. Number two, we know why it's happening. We know why Job is enduring the suffering he is. But you know what? Job didn't. Job didn't know. It's easy to read when you see David running for his life, first from his son, then from Saul. And you say, it's okay. He becomes the man after God's heart, the great king. It's easy to see because we know how it ends. Elijah sitting by the brook Cherith waiting to be fed, Right? Wondering if the famine was going to hit him. And yet we knew that while he just waited with no answers, God had a plan. You ever watched you know, a scary movie, but you've seen it already? And so you're bored? Yeah, I know. They should go around that corner, hide behind the chainsaws. What are they thinking, right? Because you've seen it. You know the end. That's a bad illustration, but a simple point. That because we read the stories in Scripture, we know God's faithfulness to them. But because we know the end, the question is... Is God going to step in and intervene in what we're dealing with right now and what God's asked us to do in stepping out in faith? That child you're praying for, that, that uh, parent you're praying for, that coworker you're praying for, that neighbor you're trying to reach, that ministry that God's put on your heart, that desire to step out and do something uh, for you, that God's moving. Can you do it? Will God go before you? Will God do it? And then you ask the question, is anything too hard for God? By the way, we would all agree the answer is no. But yet we face something that either we want God to do or that God's asking us to do. And it might be a bit frightening. So what I want to do is kind of twofold. We're going to talk a little bit about the battles facing us today and God's promises. But I'm going to challenge us to move beyond that to taking the gifts that God has given us and stepping out and serving God and trusting his promises. Three things this morning we'll look at. Number one, God's promise is based upon God's character. His promise is based upon his character. Back to verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked and behold three men were standing by him. And when he saw them he ran to the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said my Lord if I have now found favor in your sight do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. 
And I will bring a morsel of the bread that you may refresh your hearts. And after that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent of Sarah to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. And he took butter and milk and, ca and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So here's the first question you come down is, who were these three people? They're, you know, we see Abraham and Sarah are much older now. They're knocking the door of a hundred. They're older, well past the age to be able to have a child. And three men walk their way up to the camp. Now, the first thing we see here is obviously these are ordinary men. Now, please understand, Middle Eastern culture is very normal to be gracious and kind. But there's something very different about these three men. A lot of different opinions. I have my opinion of who they are. Um, first of all, I believe the one that Jesus is speaking to is Jesus. It's what many theologians call a Christophany. A Christophany is where Jesus takes human form and interacts in the Old Testament with people. There's also one called the Theophany where God takes form. I happen to believe this is Jesus. And he comes and I believe Abraham recognized it right away. Who are the other two men? Some believe it's a picture of the Trinity. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe, because you know what happens shortly after the story? Two angels go down to pronounce punishment on Sodom and Gomorrah. I believe it's Jesus with the two angels. They're on their way to pronounce judgment at Sodom and Gomorrah. They kind of stop by to give a promise to Abraham on the way through. Abraham recognizes this right away. And so he begins to worship him. Let's look at a few things about this God as we look at this who he is. Jesus is God. Let's look at this. Number one, he recognized the person of God. Abraham recognized the person of God. And by the way, this is where it must start. Who is God? Can we trust him? Can we trust him for salvation? Have you had a time when you put your faith in God for salvation? I do not say church. I don't mean baptism. I don't mean the preacher. Have you put your trust in Jesus for salvation? You know, you can't earn your way to heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't go to enough church to get you to heaven. You only go to heaven by putting your faith in Christ alone and letting him be the one that imputes his righteousness into your life. Have you done that this morning? Could you say beyond a shadow of a doubt that if your life this week were to end somehow, surprisingly, and you're into eternity, the Bible says it's appointed a man wants to die and after this a judgment. If your life ends, it's over. Do you know for sure that you'd be in heaven? Please understand, I'm not trying to scare you. What I'm trying to say is God wants you to be there. God put a son on the cross so that you can have free salvation earned through him. Do we trust his person for salvation? How about... For those of us who are saved, do we trust him for the mountains and the giants that we're facing? I'm going to read some scripture to you uh, that just talk about this. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. The Bible says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Revelation 1.8. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So here's my question. Do you know this Jesus? As a person, or do you know him as a religious figure? Let me give you an example. A few weeks ago, my, my son and I went down to Los Angeles. I mean, to clarify, we went down to SoFi for a Rams game who happened to be playing the Eagles. So you can figure out which team I was going to cheer for. And I will tell you, in the whole area where I was sitting, there was one Rams fan. I felt such at home. I'm telling you. So at home, surrounded by the green of Philadelphia fans. And Los Angeles Philadelphia fans are so nice. Philadelphia, Philadelphia fans are not. But those out here, they're so nice. Right? But I'll never forget, we're sitting there, we're enjoying the game. And all of a sudden, we're about two rows from the front of our section. And down below us, I start seeing a bunch of people. Oh, they're going nuts and they're pointing at somebody. And at first, there was what I guess they call them social media influencers. You know, people paid money to put things on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. I didn't recognize them. I'm like, eh, okay, whatever. And then all I know is they paid a lot of money to sit down there. And then as I reached over, 
I recognize two people. Right? One of them I recognize. You might know his name. I think they call him Cedric the Entertainer. Some of you know him. All right. He's on TV. I looked down, and there he was, 100 feet from me. All right? Now, you understand, I know who he is because I've seen him on TV, a couple of his shows, right? And there was, I, I couldn't walk down to the edge and say, Cedric, it's me. Let me come on down and join you. That would have gotten me kicked out of the game, all right? I know who he is because I've seen him on TV. I've watched some interviews. I've heard a little bit of his comedy. I recognize him, but you know, I don't know him. I know who he is, but I don't know him. And he definitely doesn't know me. Sometimes I'm afraid that that's what we do when it comes to knowing God. We know who he is. He lives in heaven. We know he is the founder of the church. We know some of what the Bible says about him. We know some of the Bible stories. We have family and friends who trust in him. But when it really comes down to it, we don't know him any better than I knew a comedian. We don't. And that's the thing. Do we know Jesus intimately? Number one is our personal savior. Do we know about Jesus? We might know who he is, what he's what he's done for others, what the Bible says about him, but we do know. I love what Paul says in Philippians 3. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformed to his death. You know what he says? That word know, it's more than just knowledge. The Greek word gives the idea of experiential knowledge. I know him because I've experienced him in my life. You know, when you go through battles with other people, you get to know them better. You get to know how they handle being scared, right? You get to know how they handle snakes. You get to know, you get to know them. And the more you get to know somebody by spending time with them, the more you understand this word that I may know Jesus. He says the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. It's not an easy knowledge being conformed to his death. So I ask you the question, do we know Jesus as our savior? Do we know Jesus? Do we know his comfort in hard times? Do we know his power in the storms of life? Do we recognize his guidance when we're lost? Do we recognize the voice of God in our life over the many other voices trying to get our attention today? When we're hurting, do we recognize it? Can we go back and remember the last time God answered prayer? Can we say how God's moved? Can we say, I know we're going the direction because this is what God has me to do? Can we say, this is what God has asked us to do as a family and lead? Do we have that knowledge? And please understand, this is not a desire to make you feel guilty. Because you know what it takes to know that? One, spend time with him and trust him when he allows you into the storm. Whatever you're facing right now, trust him. It doesn't mean it'll turn out the way you think it will. It almost never does because his ways are not my ways. But I trust him. But it's not just trusting him to solve the problem I'm facing. It's trusting him to provide when I step out in faith. When God says, I want you to witness to that neighbor. I want you to call that family member and get things right. I want you to go home and tell your wife I'm sorry. Or I want you to, to do these things. I want you to step in obedience. I want you to maybe one day teach a class. For some of you, that would be exciting. For some of you, you're already nervous in your stomach thinking about it, right? The idea of being in front of people. I want you to minute, how, I'm, I'm witness to your neighbor. I want you to start tithing. I want you to do some of these things. And we immediately become nervous. And we have a million reasons why we can't do that. You ever notice when God says, invite your neighbor to church? So if you were trying to do that for Western days, you have every intention to do that. And every time you step out, there's a reason why you can't invite them. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's too dark. It's too early. They just left. They don't want me knocking on the door. All those things. I just want, Satan gave you a million reasons why not. But is anything too hard for God? Whatever God's asked for you, is it too hard for him? Because you're not doing it. You're just stepping out in obedience. God's the one doing the work. We can recognize the person of God and we can trust him with our salvation or struggles because we recognize his sovereignty. We recognize his power, his love, his grace, his forgiveness. Don't begrudge whatever God's put you in right now because you will learn more about God there than you will from any message. Whatever you're facing right now, you will learn more about God there than anything that I can give you in 40 minutes here. It's intimate. It's personal. He revered the position of God. He came and worshiped. I'm just going to take a minute, share some thoughts that I read this week about what man said. When Abraham was worshiping Jesus, he did this through service. He served him personally. He didn't just give it to the work. He went out and did the work. He served him immediately. 
He served him quickly. He served him generously. He served him in humility. And he actually served him corporately. He engaged a lot of people. The key is this. When he saw Jesus, he worshiped him and he served him. God's promise is based on God's character too. God's promise is not hindered by our circumstance. Look at me again, verse 9. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. I'll explain that phrase in a second. Behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Sarah, Abraham and Sarah were old and well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Let's look at a couple of things about the circumstances. One, the reality of the situation. We can see in the situation that it technically, by human understanding, was too late for Abraham and Sarah to have a baby. Why? The phrase up there, see if I can describe what it says. It says in verse 10, Jesus says, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. Let me explain what that means. Sarah had gone past birthing age. She was no longer having the cycle to have a child. Jesus, so basically, if you say she had a dead womb, before Jesus could bring life for Isaac, she had to bring, he had to bring life to her womb. There's two miracles that took place there. So he had to give her something that no one at her age would have had. But he knew that. He said, I'm going to bring life back to your womb. But see, when you look at it, from the human standpoint, it was too late. And you could say it appeared that God had failed because it was too late. Or at least that's what it looked like from the human perspective. In this situation, the glory of God demanded God's timing and power so that God's will could be fully seen. They would never doubt Isaac as the promised son because he came in a way that only God can do it. And you're going to sit in front of something. God's going to ask you to do something. And you're scared to death about it. And you say, I don't know if I can do it. You don't have to. You just have to obey God. And when God does that through you, it's amazing you know that God did it. So you don't want to have to go out on your own. And this morning was mentioned in our Sunday school class. It was a great truth. Referencing the talents. You ever read the, the story of the parable of the talents? God gave one man two talents, another two, another one. The talents in that day dealt with money, but it really is fitting to our ability and resources and what we have today. The story concludes when the master came back. The one who had five talents doubled to ten. The one who had two doubled to four. The one who had one, what did he do? He went and hid it in the ground. And God called that one an unprofitable servant. You have not invested what I gave you. The other one, the difference was given to the one who had gained double. You say, how do I do that? Here's the simple principle. When I take what little gifts I have and I give them to God and step on obedience, God will give me more gifts. God will give me more abilities. If you want to grow in God, step out where it's uncomfortable. You know, we all say we want to be outside of the comfort zone and tell God asks us to step out of our comfort zone. And then we can't because it's uncomfortable. We don't know. Can I tell you, you step out, you say, I can't do this. And God's like, I know. When you get there, I will give you the gift to do it. That is what God's speaking about, that he can work in whatever situation. There's also, too, the reminder of God's promise. God was fully aware of of Sarah's situation and perspective. But he reminded them of his promise, which was about to be fulfilled. So why would God remind them of the promise? Here's what I want you to catch. A young boy by the name of Joseph, as a teenager, was given two dreams by God, two visions that one day he'd be in a place of authority. He was then sold into slavery, ended up in prison, and for 13 years endured that. Never once do we hear God reminding Joseph about the dreams, yet Joseph remained faithful. And yet on multiple occasions through this story, God reminds Abraham and Sarah of the promise. I don't have a a really good reason why I'm going to give you my opinion on this. Why do I think? Because they needed it. They needed that promise. That was their personality, and that's what God did. God's reassurance came in because it's exactly what they needed when it didn't make sense. So what are some promises of his to which we can hold on to? Well, obviously salvation, heaven and hell. There is an end. There is an eternity. Are we ready for it? How about his presence? He's there. But is he really? 
answered prayer. Can I go to him? And he says, if you ask and it shall be given. Is that true? Will God fulfill his promise? Is he coming back one day? Will he fulfill the promise of his word in our daily lives? By the way, the answer to all of those is yes. That's why we live according to the word of God, not according to a preacher. If you hold your opinion on what's happening right now in the world based upon my opinion, you'll find someone else who disagrees. You know what you do? Find out what God says about it. And know that God knows exactly what's happening and God's got a plan. In your life, in your circumstance, for whatever it is he's asking you to do. God's promise is based on God's character. And it's not hindered by our circumstances. But number three, God's promise is personal in nature. Verse 15. I love this part. Verse 15. The Bible says, but Sarah denied it. Saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. And he or Jesus says, no, but you did laugh. He said, that seems like such an insignificant verse. And I'm going to tell you why, for me, it's my favorite verse in this entire story. First of all, I'm going to be honest with you. This is my, when I read this the first time studying for this, I had a, I'm just going to give you the pastor's perspective of what I saw. This sounded like a junior high argument to me, doesn't it? You said it. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. That's what this sounds like to me. All right? It's like when your kids are mad. You know, he hit me first, she's looking at me, all of those things. You know, are we there yet? That's what the conversation started as when I read it. But then I began to think about this. And I asked the question, this is not just a silly conversation. Why would God put this in the Bible? Why would he choose to put a verse in the Bible for us to read in 2023? So I read up on it and I read several people who say this was God scolding Sarah. God was mad at her. Personally, I could be 100% wrong on this. That's just not what I get from it. I don't see God mad at her. Yes, you laughed. I know you did. Ha! I just don't see God doing that. You know what I see? I see God says, Sarah, you laughed. She goes, no, I didn't. Because every other human does not know what's going on in Sarah's mind. And God comes back and goes, no, you did. Because I heard it. I know your fear. I know your thoughts. I know your apprehension. And I care. That's what he was saying. I don't think he was out there trying to make Sarah look bad. You know, could think about this. I have never, to glory of glory, had to deal with what is coming for her. I'm a guy, all right? My wife dealt with that, all right? Generally speaking, especially for our second child, I fell asleep. They woke us up, ready? Because we're waiting. I didn't have to do a whole lot when it came to that. But... It's not easy. Sarah is really old. And I wonder if it goes through her mind. Can I even live through this? Can I endure the discomfort at my age? Can I keep up with the toddler at 100 years old? I mean, think about it. I don't know if I can make it at 2 in the morning when they're screaming, right? I don't know if I can do that. you got to imagine that Sarah's like, this would have been easier 50 years ago. I don't know. I'm just getting my opinion. But all I know is Sarah, and you know what you can get, I believe, is easy to see here. Sarah mocks. Really? You've told me this over and over. Now it's going to come true? I believe we can read in and see that. In any bit, Sarah obviously was not 100% convinced. But God says, it's okay. I know your thought. It's okay. My promise is still true. So what does that tell me in our final thoughts for me today? What does that remind me about God today? Number one, God knows my fears and my doubts. God knows our fears and our doubts. Whatever, what was going through her mind that we don't even know, God knew, and that's what matters. I am sure there are many normal thoughts that came with that laughter that Sarah was talking about. And God didn't look at the anger. He didn't say, how dare you? He just says, I know. And when God asks you to do something, you say, I'm nervous. I'm afraid. I know. It's okay. When God says, I want you to go reconcile, I want you to get this right, I want you to start, step up ministry, I want you to serve, I want you to do this. And you say, Lord, what about this? What if I fail? He says, I know. It's okay, I'm there. God knows my fears and doubts. Two, God knows my shortcomings. God knows my shortcomings. You ever heard the phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle? Okay, I'm going to give you my opinion on this. I mentioned this in our class this morning too, all right? For my opinion, I don't agree with that phrase as it's stated. Let me tell you my opinion. I believe that God always gives us more than we can handle. And then he gives us the grace to handle it. 
This is why without Jesus, the world's falling apart. Because they're trying to fulfill God's design, God's plan. And they're doing it without God. Can you imagine dealing with the loss of a loved one without God? Can you imagine trying to rear a young baby without God? Can you imagine forgiving and reconciling without God? Can you imagine dealing with that coworker that drives you nuts without God? Can you imagine coming to church without God? Right? All of this. God knows our shortcomings. God did not say, because think about it. If I look at it, God will never give me more than I can handle. Then it's all on me. I need God for every part of my life. Every part of my life. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is where Jesus is talking to um, Paul. Paul's asking for healing. And he says, no. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God, you've given me this weakness. I can use it for your glory. We want it to be solved. We want all the problems to disappear. And God may say, no, I'm actually going to use your weakness, your struggle to be an opportunity to reach others. I love what he says in Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, to you, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient to the day, is its own trouble. You know what God said here? You have some battles, you don't know what's happening tomorrow, and you're living today anxious about tomorrow. And the Bible says, tomorrow is going to be full of its own problems. But you know what God is not going to give you until tomorrow? The grace to deal with the situation tomorrow. We live today, and the grace that God has given us today we deal with whatever it is that God has put in our life today. And then when we get up in the morning, we embrace the grace that God has given us for what's coming tomorrow and the next day and the next day. That's how God works. He's personal nature. He's right there at all times. He knows my shortcomings and he's good with it. Why? Because he gave me my shortcomings. He gave you your weakness. Think about that. I remember when I first told my parents years ago, I was 11 years old, I got back from camp, and I told my mom and dad, I was like, God's calling me to preach. And they did what every good parent would do. Praise the Lord, that's great, that's exciting, wonderful. And then later that day, I heard them talking. They're like, you think he can do it? I had a problem with speaking, still do, pretty much. But when I was younger, a pretty bad speech impediment. It wasn't easy for me. As you know, my brain works faster than my mouth, which is never a good thing anyway. You know what's intriguing? As we grew, my parents would point out, we actually thought that would stop you from being able to do this. or thought that would be a weakness. But here's the thing. If God's called you to do something, he'll give you the grace for it. So step out in boldness. Step out and say, God, I don't know what it is. Or I, you want me to do this, but I can do this. Now, please understand, there's different seasons of life. You know, Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, you know, there's a day, time, and season for everything under heaven. Some of you work with kids. It's great. You have the energy. Some of you, not as much energy. We won't say why, okay? Not as much energy with some of the younger kids. That's okay. God will give you something for that season. Right now in your season, it's got, some, got something for you. And it may not be what you think it is right now. It may be something completely different that God is designing you for, for this time in your life. Let me give you a thir thir uh, one last thought, then I'll finish. God does, God does his best work with our greatest weakness. God does his best work with our greatest weakness. Because our weakness is part of God's design. Let me finish with one thought. In a ch and I think I've said this, but it bears repeating. In Psalm chapter 1, you know, it starts off, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate day and night. Then the next verse, verse 3, And he should be like a tree... Planted by the rivers of water. Now, years ago I was reading through a Charles Spurgeon commentary. And he focused a lot of attention on one word. Oh, several pages. Spurgeon's good at that. One word. He can go forever. I can't, but he was good at it. And what was the word? Planted. Why? It was passive. You say, I still don't know what that means. Either did I. If you're planted by the rivers of water, someone's put you there. You didn't put yourself there. The season you're in right now is God's plan. What he's asking you to do is God's plan. He's planted you there. So what do I do? Flourish 
where I'm planted. Yes, I have something I'd love to do, and maybe God will give it to me right one day, but right now, God's put me here. Flourish where you are. Grow where you are. Make where you are better. Do it there. And then when you've learned everything you can there, God will give you something else and keep going. We're all waiting to serve God sometimes when God gives me this or solves this problem. And God's like, you step out, then I'll give you the grace for it. I don't know where you are, what's hurting, what might be frightening or intimidating. God knows. He's put you there for a reason. Say, God, what can I do? Embrace it, grow, and watch him move in your life in a way that you can never do on your own. Before we close in prayer, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. Number one, do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? The personal nature of God we talk about is a personal Savior. It's not religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. Do you know? In a little bit, we're going to have an invitation. There'll be some men up here. We'd love a chance to talk to you. I promise you we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you out. But we'd love a chance to take the word of God and show you what the Bible says about salvation. Not our opinion. Not what the church believes. But what the Bible says what Jesus told us about heaven. And you can know, leave today knowing for sure you're on your way to heaven. Is there something in your life that's overwhelming? A struggle? A mountain? A giant? And you're just seeing that you can't get by it? Is there something God is pushing in your heart to do? And you're nervous? Because Satan's given you a million reasons not to do it in your season of life. Is anything too hard for God? We love you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to look into your word today. The wonderful privilege to study it to learn about you, to be reminded through two of your servants that you work even in our weakness. I am grateful for the personal nature of you, Lord, that you love us, you know us, you work in the ways that we need you to because you've designed us. And even when we feel like we failed or are failing, you can use our weakness to do things that we could never do in our own strength. I pray if there's anyone here that's not sure they're saved, that doesn't know what it means to know you personally, that today would be the day that they would call upon you for salvation. I pray if there's those who have to say life seems to be overwhelming and they have a mountain bearing down on them and they feel like there's nothing they can do, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts. Give them grace to know that you are aware. Father, maybe somebody in the season they're in, you're asking them to take a step of faith and they're scared. Would you, Lord, step out? Help them to step out. Would you give them the grace? today to be able to accomplish what you have in your life. With head bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. In just a second, we'll sing. I ask you a quick qu couple questions or a couple opportunities. Again, Pastor Steve and I and others will be available. If you want to know how to get saved, here's what you do. I promise you, anybody here who sees you moving to the front is just going to pray for you because we love you. This is what it's all about. We'll be here. Just come and say, I want to know how to get saved. That's it. We'll sit down with you, introduce you to somebody who will take you somewhere and just share the word of God with you. I promise you it will never be something to embarrass you. It is just to answer your questions. If you'd like to pray with someone today, you say, I'm struggling. I need someone to pray with me, pray over me, or just to be there. There'll be people up here front. Come talk to us. We'll pray with you. If one of us walk out of the way, an elder will take our place if you need someone to pray with. If you say, Pastor, I just want to come to the altar by myself, do that as well. The next, these closing moments, spend some time with God. Whatever God is doing, ask the question, is anything too hard for God? And give him whatever it is you're facing. Lord, in these closing moments, would you speak in a way that I cannot? I have pray, preached what you've asked. I've shared what you've shared upon my heart. And Lord, may you do and may you work in a way that me and my frailty cannot. I pray, Lord, you'll speak to hearts, encourage the saints, and Lord, maybe even call sinners. We love you, Lord. Pray you bless in Jesus' name. Amen.